Let me one sec. Um, okay, they have the recording working. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. First talk of the day. Okay. Should we close the door in the back? Now i so I'm going to be talking about HTTPS removal techniques specializing in applications that are not web browsers. So as in removal, I mean let's take off the layer of HTTPS so we can see the traffic inside to do a security assessment. So I'm coming here from ISE, Independent Security Evaluators. We're a security assessment company located in Baltimore. We specialize in white box assessments, basically adversary minded, we're taking products apart, setting them up just like a real adversary. So here are some of the things we specialize in, white box assessments, types of customers, and so on. So we always put in a plug for the company. So talking about HTTPS, the first thing I always want to talk about is the difference between HTTPS and TLS. So you see oftentimes the SSL, TLS, and HTTPS all get thrown around. So just to clarify. Remember the OSI model, simplified here. So you have your Ethernet or wireless IP address, TCP, and then on top of that, TLS is really designed to be a plug and play almost mechanism for wrapping those socket API calls, open, send, receive, close, and so on. On top of which, you could put any protocol. So these S versions of any protocol are in reality just some unencrypted protocol layered on top of TLS. So put HTTP, you get HTTPS. But it can also be any protocol. So email, IMAP, POP3, and SFTP. The core protocol underneath is always TLS, but you could put something entirely custom or something that hasn't even been invented yet. In fact, there is even a UDP version of TLS that not everyone's aware of called DTLS. So the actual idea can apply to many different things. So most of the things I'll be going over apply to TLS, but by virtue of that, you could use them for HTTPS or anything. As far as distinctions, so maybe HTTPS is not really a strict subset of TLS, and some of the biggest differences there are these extended validation certificates. And if you go to a banking website, they have a special certificate that does not just verify the domain name, but also the company and your address bar changes to reflect that. So that is actually over and above what plain TLS would have, what X509 would have. And the differences are in terms of what standards body is regulating this. And CA Browser Forum specializes in browsers, and IETF covers TLS. And sometimes there can be minor differences between the two. If you're following along with HTTP2 or Speedy, a lot of this could get a lot different as that gets more popular. So before we defeat TLS, let's take a look at the fundamentals, what it provides, and so on. So the main specialty of TLS is message confidentiality. I send a credit card number from my laptop to an e-commerce site, someone watching the traffic over wireless or in control of an intermediate router between the client and server cannot read what is being sent. But that's not the only thing. Message integrity is the second one. So if a bit is flipped in that message on its way to the server, that's detected and recovered from. So this doesn't seem quite as important as confidentiality at first, but in reality, without integrity, the confidentiality can be defeated as well. Anyone thinks of Poodle? So the core problem with Poodle was that the padding when encrypting something in CBC mode was not authenticated. So that's message integrity. And perhaps the most important part of TLS is server authentication. So you can verify you're talking to the correct server without these other two steps. Right? Who cares if it's confidential if you're talking to a phishing site? <coughs> and the moral of the story will be if we're able to defeat the server authentication step in practice, we can defeat TLS in its entirety. So how does TLS come in with our security testing and security assessments? So I take it, how many of you here use Burp Suite? Probably a lot. So, so Burp Suite, of course, if you're looking at something that uses HTTP, traditionally a browser, not necessarily mobile applications and so on, Burp Suite will sit there as an intercepting proxy between the client and server. It'll allow you to stop and block a message on its way between the two sides and edit it, maybe repeat it, 
maybe you're looking at CSRF, you might take the CSRF token out and send it anyway, see if it still works. And so, Burp Suite is not the only tool that works in this way, although it might be the well known, most well known. OWASP Zap is another one, it's free. Burp Suite, only a limited version, is free. But the one I'll be focusing on, which is very simple, is Man in the Middle Proxy or Meetup Proxy with that logo. And these all, as far as I'm concerned, and just for moving TLS, all of them would be suitable. So how does TLS normally work? I'll get into the details of how this actually works a little later on. But your client device on this slide of phone connects through some intermediate network infrastructure, maybe a wireless router, probably a lot of Cisco devices, some fiber optic cables and so forth on its way to the server. Once that connection is made, the server proves its identity with a certificate, and then it goes down to the client and the connection continues. So how does this interfere with security testing? Well, when we put Burp Suite into play, we no longer have that direct link to the server. And because of the principles of asymmetric cryptography, just seeing the server certificate does not allow Burp Suite to pretend to be that server. So what it does is create a second certificate on the fly. Problem comes in, that second certificate is not trusted by the client because it knows Burp Suite is not a legitimate CA. So what I'll focus on for the rest of the talk is how certificate validation certificate verification can be defeated on different kinds of devices. If you've used Burp Suite, you're used to doing that in a web browser. It can work differently on a number of different platforms, mobile applications, and so on. And I'll get into the details. The secondary layer of how TLS works. So TLS is focusing on, as we said, providing this encrypted communication channel with integrity protection and server <coughs> verification. The actual asymmetric cryptography under the hood is that every server, and possibly client though it's not common, has a key pair, a public key and a private key. That server will provide the public key to anyone who connects in the certificate that's embedded inside. A client who connects can send a message to the server by encrypting it using that public key. And I've shown a safe here, if it's closed to me, it's encrypted. Nobody can open that safe without the private key, and of course, the only one in possession of the private key is the server. So, you have a decrypted message there. That provides the first step, which is confidentiality. The second step is partially provided by digital signatures. So, a goofy little image to represent that. So, if you reverse the role of the two keys, the server can quote, encrypt, kind of, a message with its private key, which means you have to have the public key to decrypt it, which everybody has. And what that actually provides is it proves that someone in possession of the private key says that this message is authentic. All of those, those two principles of asymmetric cryptography but get put together to produce a certificate. So the certificate at its core, all it does is take a public key and bind it to a domain name using asymmetric cryptography. So the types of fields that are in there, what is the distinguished name ends up being the domain name, a validity period, the key we're talking about, and then a second asymmetric signature by the certificate authority. How this works is you chain certificates together, just like this. So you might have a server certificate that is in turn signed by an intermediate certificate authority, who is in turn by, signed by a root certificate authority. So how do you know what the roots are? Well, TLS supporting applications either come with a embedded or hard-coded list, or they ask your operating system. So these root CAs are something that Mozilla, Google, Apple have a program to decide who's trusted to be root, a root CA, who is not. Important point, just because they trust someone doesn't mean that you should. Lots of things going on in that area with the um, CAs that have been removed for misconduct and so forth. So given these technologies, TLS prevents the real world attack, which is the man in the middle of adversary, looking at or modifying your traffic. For us, the problem is the security researcher is also treated as the same kind of threat. So the first technique I want to show here on the various platforms is if we develop our own root certificate authority, because that list on these various platforms is actually editable, usually, then we can be the root CA and we can see the traffic. 
So the man in the middle proxy comes back into play. It's a text-based application, so like an in-person style interface. It's free, it's GPL2 or GPL3. It comes in the packaging system for Debian. So if I personally was needing to set up medium proxy, the quickest way to do so is install VirtualBox to set up a virtual machine, possibly running Debian. I think any Debian-derived distribution would also work. I have found like Fedora, Red Hat don't have it in the packaging system. It's a Python program with a lot of like conflicting dependencies with what comes in the OS, so that's a world of pain if you decide to go that way. The important part though is once you get this operating system installed, install Media Proxy from the packaging system is to set up your networking environment appropriately. So when you install a virtual machine, it usually defaults to NAT mode, so it's giving it some artificial address like 10, 0, 2, or something. And that really is only suitable for outgoing connections, unless you set up port forwarding rules and so forth. But we'll be working at a lower level where the port forwarding is not sufficient and NAT is just not appropriate for what we're trying to do. We're actually going to act as a router where incoming traffic from the application or device we're studying will be routed to our VM. So bridged networking mode <coughs> simulates if your VM had its own dedicated Ethernet connection to the same network your machine is on. Important point I have found and some of my colleagues have also found, if your host machine connection is over wireless, there are all kinds of problems that come into play with ARP and so on. So use an Ethernet connection when you do this. Next step, once you're in bridge mode, you'll have to configure IP tables. So this is a little complicated at first, but in reality it's only three rules that actually do the root of the work. So what this is saying here in the NAT table of IP tables, we're picking two ports, 80 and 443, which of course would be HTTP and HTTPS. Those are special cases, they get redirected to port 8080. Something will be listening on the local machine on port 8080, which is meter proxy. All other traffic gets passed through in masquerade mode, which causes the virtual machine to do its own NAT on that traffic. So visual diagram, ports 80 and 443 get sent to burp suite on the local machine. Everything else gets passed through without interference. Once you have IP tables configured, you can start meter proxy in different modes depending on the scenario where you're working. So medium proxy can work in two ways. If you've been using it to study a web application, you've probably either used medium proxy or another tool like Burp Suite only in the first way that I have on the screen, which is that application <coughs> sits and listens on port 8080 and waits for HTTP proxy connections to come in. So the way that works is a client, like a web browser or application, connects to port 8080 and it before it starts communicating with the server, it sends like connect, host port, HTTP 1.0, and so forth. That HTTP layer connection switches over to just a tunnel between the client and the server it has to connect to. So that requires, the downside is that requires explicit support for HTTP proxies in the client. Web browsers are fine. IoT devices, it might be a little more questionable. So Mina proxy has a second mode called transparent mode. And in this mode, you use IP tables to trick the client device into sending its traffic to medium proxy. It will no longer look like an HTTP request. And medium proxy needs a way to know where was this connection supposed to go originally so I can proxy it. And the dash T activates this transparent mode. There's a special socket call in the Linux kernel called original destination. This causes <coughs> medium proxy to use that call to look up where the connection was going before it got redirected. So given that ability, we no longer need the client to support HTTP proxies, yes. Uh, does it work with, with uh, related to, to Squid? Um, Squid actually supports the same thing, yes. Um, Squid, I don't think we'll do the certificate, taking a certificate on the fly. Okay. Right. But yes, plain text HTTP, this is a very common way to do that. Now that almost everything is HTTPS, not so effective anymore. So I'm going to spend some time talking about how to configure various client devices to go through Meta proxy and accept its fake certificate of authority. As stated, devices fall into two categories, those that support HTTP proxies and those that do not. 
Browsers definitely support proxies. iOS has good HTTP proxy support. And most desktop applications, if they don't have proxy configuration in the application, they will usually do whatever Internet Explorer is configured to do. So I'll get to it in a minute. On the other hand, Android applications are kind of iffy. There's a proxy setting. Many applications don't obey it. And they're not required to obey it. And many types of standalone devices, like I showed the slide earlier, an IoT thermostat, good luck as far as to <laughs> figure out how to configure a proxy. My general technique will be let's force the traffic generated by that device into medium proxy, get the medium proxy fake certificate authority, convince the device to trust it, and then we can see the traffic. The challenge be, unlike a web browser, you can't just click through a certificate warning. Most applications won't let you go back, so we'll just say certificate. So Windows native applications. So this could be your traditional C++, MFC type of application or .NET. Luckily, most, or luckily for us, most Windows applications will look at however Internet Explorer is configured and just do what that says. So Google Chrome is the biggest example. If you go into Google Chrome and you try to configure certificate authorities, it launches the IE settings. You never notice that. So if you go into the control panel or go to Internet Explorer and get into the proxy configuration, you'll see this dialog. In this case, we will configure an actual explicit HTTP proxy, host, and port. These are just examples. If you do this, medium proxy should not have that dash T because you're, no, you're not in transparent mode. Once you've done this, if you use burp suite, there's an internal burp address similar for medium proxy. If you go from your client device, to the special medium or MITM.it web page. You're reaching an internal web server built into the proxy whose only purpose is to distribute you the certificate authority that it's using to produce these web server certificates on the fly. In IE, you would click on Windows. The only distinction between the links are the format in which the certificate is distributed. So you click Windows, it tries to download it, press open. Certificate Import Wizard. So this is a not straightforward way to someone who just wasn't expecting this to happen, but it's allowing you to import this certificate into the system's trusted list. So you just follow the wizard, follow the path to the certificate. There's a password field. This doesn't serve a purpose in this case because this P12 format can also be used to deliver encrypted private keys. There is no private key in this case, you leave it blank. It's asking you in what list of certificates should I put this new certificate if you hit browse. One of those is trusted root certification authority. <laughs> right? So you put it in that list, it will now be trusted. So as you finish up. Now we finally, like eight steps in, finally get a warning like maybe this isn't a good idea. So it's warning you, you put it in this list, you basically undermine TLS if this isn't legitimate, which it isn't. So you press yes. And at any time, you can view the list of current trusted certificate authorities by going through the Internet Options dialog. You can actually see I was using Burp Suite on the same machine, two lines lower. So interesting, there's one called No Liability Accepted. I think that's only the timestamp. Once you've added this Media Proxy Certificate to the trusted list, you can visit a site like google.com over TLS. If you view the certificate, which you can go in the address bar and this button to do so, it's only trusted by Media Proxy. You wouldn't be expecting something like VeriSign or some other legitimate business, but not in this case. All right, if you go back to Media Proxy, you can actually see that traffic despite it saying HTTPS see the, the URL and if I would press enter you would see the actual communication in both directions. So the reason I show IE once again is most applications will follow whatever IE is configured to do. So if you're looking at some proprietary .NET program, try this first. The problem is applications on Windows that don't follow these settings. Well for proxy we can just do transparent mode and I'll cover that on Android anyway so that's not so much of a problem. The bigger issue is if they have their own list of trusted CAs. The biggest example would be Firefox for historical reasons. Remember Netscape basically invented SSL, so why would they use a Windows implementation that didn't exist yet? 
and that still comes down to the present day. So Firefox will not use the Windows list of trusted CVs. Chrome will. So that's an interesting thing. If an application uses Microsoft's provided TLS implementation, it will use that list generally. If they bundle their own, it probably will not. The two biggest libraries to look out for are OpenSSL, of course, which on Windows is probably libby for historical reasons, and NSS, which is actually what Mozilla uses. So oftentimes those might come in if the biggest example I've seen is the programs that will let you convert a Python script into an executable will often have like a bundled copy of OpenSSL inside, which may or may not use the system-wide trusted list. Uh, other things like TCL or uh, Ruby or who knows what else, they're probably doing all kinds of different things as far as if they trust anything, right, they might just ignore certificates. Java is another example. That one I'm actually going to show explicitly is an example of like it's a custom language specific way. But first, Android. So again, on Android, there is a proxy setting in Android 4 or later, which at this point is a long time. It wasn't a while ago. But this proxy setting I'm choosing not to use just because it is not always reliable. An application can go around the proxy. If it decides to, you will miss that traffic and you won't be able to see it. If it's not HTTP, you would have the same issue possibly. So what I'm doing here is instead of putting the virtual machine address under HTTP proxy, I set it as the default gateway. Because of those IP tables rules, it actually is sufficient to work as a router. Once you do that and go back into the web browser, try to go to a TLS site. If you don't get this warning, you made a mistake and it's not going through the proxy. So you should get a certificate warning. Similar as on Windows, you can go to the special website, press on Android. You have to give it a unique name. So media proxy is fine unless you've already installed it earlier. Interesting thing on Android, you have to have a pin on your device in order to add a trusted CA. It doesn't seem very logical at first, but the reason is that the credential storage feature can be used for other things than CAs that might actually matter, like private keys. So in order to use that interface at all, you have to have a pin set if you haven't set one already. <coughs> because you're doing security testing, maybe you aren't really worrying about a lock screen, but in this case you have to have one, so zero, 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 might be good. Once you've done that, you can go back into the web browser, similar as I did on IE, go to google.com, you'll see a certificate signed by MediaProx. Most Android applications will similarly use whatever the system provides, with some exceptions that I'll get to shortly. But if it's working, you can see the traffic generated in MediaProx. Now, unlike Windows, I'd say maybe 80% of Android applications actually follow the system-wide list. First problem, if you try to do the proxy setting, despite the default gateway. It's unreliable. Some applications will follow it, and some will not. It might depend on if they want to access a website, do they use like Java URL class, or do they embed their own custom class? It could vary depending on how it's implemented. Second one, and this will be increasingly important in the future. Now I think Android 7 is only like two months old or something, so this probably isn't affecting anyone yet but they hardened the way that trusted certificate authorities work in Android 7. A default application with the API version set appropriately, by default, will only trust the certificate authorities that came bundled with Android. So you add a custom one, it will not be trusted. So use an old version for now, but in the future, there are ways to patch an application with a special flag using something like APK tool to tell it that, okay, I want to trust user added CAs as well. So that will be more important in the future. Um, looking ahead to later in my presentation, certificate pinning simply means at the point that we're carrying, trusting, managing the list of trusted CAs yourself rather than allowing the operating system to tell you who to trust. And there are pluses and minuses to that that we'll get to. Finally, on Android, you can actually mix Java code, which 
an Android application is normally written in with C and C++ code if you want. That Java native interface side, if that has its own copy of OpenSSL inside, or who knows what, it's hard to tell what's going on there. And just adding the certificate to Android is probably not going to be enough. You probably need to do something a little more advanced. So looking from there to iOS, mm -hmm. similar configuration yeah, to Android. In this case, I did the default gateway. HTTP proxy probably would have worked as well. Just make sure meta proxy is matching the mode you pick. Same approach, web browser, certificate authority. No pin necessary on iOS. And if it works, you see the traffic. So similar configuration to the other platforms we looked at. Certificate pinning is the most popular problem on iOS I've run into. There are some applications you can try to run on a jailbroken device that will try and overcome common ways of doing certificate pinning. SSL kill switch is one of them. I'll get into the actual details of certificate pinning later on. So if you have the principles of what they're doing, you should be able to look at applications that maybe no one's seen that particular way of doing certificate pinning before. And you might be able to come up with your own way to get around it. Last platform I want to look at is Java. So Java does not always use on Windows the Internet Explorer or other system-wide proxy settings. And I've never seen it use the certificate authority list that the OS provides. So this is a case where Java's like portability goal says like we're not going to use these platform-specific APIs. So in this case, we're working with a Windows client running some Java application. Maybe we don't want to deal with HTTP proxy configuration because an application doesn't follow it, maybe. Go into your Windows networking settings and set a default gateway on your own. Most likely. Once you've done this and media proxy is in place, let's try to run a Java application that uses HTTPS. I found some called jcurl, which for some reason someone felt like writing a version of curl for Java, That's, which is fine, right? So if you download that jar file, I think it's on SourceForge or GitHub or something, and you run it, give it a URL that's over HTTPS. If media proxy is running, you get this long message, it goes even further, basically telling you certificate is not trusted. And notice again, unlike a web browser, there's no override option, right? So you've got to find another way to get that certificate to be trusted. Well, Java has its own list of trusted CAs that is in this location. Now, be careful if you try to take this on because depending on what security testing maybe you're doing, you might have multiple versions of the Java runtime on your machine, especially on Windows 32-bit, 64-bit, the Java browser applet plugin generally works best with 32-bit. You know, everything new would be 64. Also, if you've been writing Java applications or compiling them, you probably have the JDK as well, which usually includes another copy of the JRE. So you could have three or more versions installed. Just make sure you're editing the file that corresponds to the version you are actually running. Okay, so once again, you have a special web page. I believe it's other, just any of these that is in a format that is PEM format. You download that certificate, put it in a safe place where you can get to it later. Editing that list. I'll use a tool called Porticle, which is designed to edit Java key store files, including the CA certs. So this again, it's another tool, it's either in package repositories or you go on the internet and find it. Open the application, it itself is also written in Java. Makes sense. Make sure you run it at a high privilege level so that you can actually edit the CA certs file. So on Windows, if you have UAC enabled, you'll have to right click and do run as administrator on another platform. Maybe you do it as root or sudo or something. Browse to that CA certs file and open it. Interestingly enough, there's a password, even though nothing secret is in that file. This is just a feature of the key store format. In this case, it's only used as an integrity check. And the password is change it. And ironically, if you did, Java wouldn't work anymore. <laughs> right. 
Once you get in there, you will see a list of the CAs that are already in the list. Interestingly, again, this is a completely independent list from what your OS has. So if you remember the um, DigiNotar thing like a long time ago, the CA was compromised. Microsoft can patch it, but if your Java version is old, it would still be in there. So just something to notice. Once you get in here, though, if you go to Tools and Import Trusted Certificate, it will allow us to browse to the pen file we downloaded from Beta Proxy. Okay. Unlike Internet Explorer, it warns us right away. So it's telling us it's not trusted. Click through all these steps to tell it that you trust it. Give it a name. And it imports. Save that CA certs file. If you forgot to run it with administrator, then you'll be having to exit and do it over. <laughs> then this time we run jcurl and I cut off the output, but you see response code 200, it works. So that's how you edit the list of trusted CAs on Java. And conceivably any language or platform you work with, somewhere it has a list like that most likely. The most unfortunate case is if it's managed programmatically, so you can't just edit a data file. And then that's why I get into some more advanced techniques. So the first is certificate pinning. So there's no just list, no list that you can just edit and go. It can happen in different ways. This is something developers do as a security hardening technique when they're worried about maybe an adversary doing this <coughs> tactic that we're doing or certain data loss prevention proxies and so forth. So you want to control as an application developer who you trust. Certificate authority pinning, which is something I made up is if you have a embedded list of CAs in your application that you trust. It could also be actual certificate pinning in that I connect to the server, I only trust this one certificate, and obviously that can be a problem if it expires or if the key gets compromised, now you've got to replace all these executables out there. I'll focus on two ways to get around it, debugging or dynamic analysis, patching or static analysis. In Java, a common way of implementing certificate pinning, and in fact, some of my colleagues actually found that there's actual advice from Google saying to do it this way, is to implement a custom trust manager class. So this is an interface that Java gives you. I have it scaled down, but the, the core methods in this interface you have to implement, check client trusted, check server trusted. So you have a method that Java will pass you a certificate, you have to decide, is it a good certificate or not? If it's bad, then you throw an exception. If it's good, you let it go. So as a person implementing certificate pending, it's now your responsibility to, to decide whether a certificate is trusted or not. Once this has been written by the developer, they will take advantage of Java's ability when you make a TLS connection. You can control the configuration of it by calling your own SSL context. It's still called SSL, despite it being TLS. It has a few options that all, if you pass null, it, it gives a default implementation, but the important one is an array of trust managers. So they're going to pass their custom trust manager to this class to override the default one. So interesting here is if we can use a debugger to stop that and replace it with null, it'll go back to the default way. So I actually made a very simple application called Custom CA that does, certi does certificate pinning to go to google.com, download the whole page of your TLS, and print it out. So if you discover that and you found what they were doing for certificate pinning, you can run this program in a debugger, set a breakpoint on this SSL context.get instance, so after it's returned, we can interfere with the later steps and run it. It will hit that breakpoint. So, SSL context, I'll get instance. Once we get to there, I'm going to step up one to the higher method that's calling it. Look at the local variables. This particular way will only work on an application with debug information in it because local variables go away otherwise. And we can see that we're actually in main, so the only argument, the only parameters are local variable though an array of trust managers. So if we can change that to null and then continue, the application actually runs 
and it and goes back to the default behavior and trusts the meaning proxy. So that's how you might do it in Java. The same idea of using a debugger, though, could apply to any language, so long as you know how to stop the correct API calls and, and flip it back. In C, they might use OpenSSL. And what I'm actually going to do, I'm kind of faking certificate pinning by using WGET. And I'm just going to pretend that it does not have a dash dash no dash check dash certificate option. So the actual API call that WGET uses is in OpenSSL, and it's called SSL get verify result. And the documentation says it returns zero if the certificate is good and non zero otherwise. So despite WGET being open source, let's pretend it's not and look at the assembly code. It calls SSL get verify result, and you can kind of imply here test and it's checking to see if it's zero. If it's not zero, it jumps somewhere else that's going to print an error message and exit. So here is the thing. If we can, instead of having it call SSL get verify result, just assume that the result was zero, then we'll be good to go. So what we can actually do with that binary, we open it maybe in a hex editor or hide a pro or I had someone suggest binary ninja. You can, if you can find the correct location, we take out the call by overwriting with not, just like you might do in the knob sled, buffer overflow, right? Just to fill up the space. And then put in an instruction to pretend that something returns zero. And then from that point forward, it will see that it's zero and it will proceed as if SSL get fire, verify result returns zero. So if, if that doesn't work, here's a general technique I think it's worth mentioning. If you are just, I guess you could call it like file carving or something, but on executables. Certificates have a, a well-defined format, ASN1, X509, and a number of other standards. So unless they've really gone to a lot of trouble to try and obfuscate how they're doing certificate pinning, chances are they use those formats to store them. Maybe they're encrypted or something that might make it more difficult. But the two formats are a binary encoding called dir, distinguished encoding rules, and a textual representation of that format called cat, privacy enhanced mail. So the dir format is using that ASN1 format. It's, you can see like a 500 page standard for it if you look for it. But it comes down to, you cannot rely on these three bytes always meaning that it is a certificate, but for these two types of RSA certificates, I found you can look for this byte sequence, and that's a potential certificate. Maybe you even write a script to take each of those offsets that you find in the program that match that, pass them to OpenSSL, ask it to parse this as a certificate. If it returns zero, then that might be where the pin certificate is stored. And the pen format is, is even easier. You can just use strings. So if you manage to find something like this, maybe it's a database, you can edit, or the binary itself. So failing this, let's take a look at some mistakes they might make that maybe you cannot control the list of trusted CAs, but you might still be able to leverage these mistakes to look at the traffic. So the first one, which hopefully you looked for before you went to all this trouble, is they don't verify certificates. So I, there have been some studies on Android applications, and it was maybe like a year or two ago or something, but it was a very high number that didn't verify certificates. Like they passed the flag to say not to. And that could be no verification at all. It doesn't matter who signed it or who it's for. We just accept everything. Or it could be a little more nuanced than that. One thing it might do is see if this certificate chains up to a trusted root, but we don't care who it's for, right? And this is actually more common than you might think because in a native application, C or C++, OpenSSL is what they likely use. And until recently, OpenSSL itself was incapable of checking the host name to see if it verified the distinguished name. That was all the responsibility of the developer to implement their own callback function. If they don't realize that and it's just, oh, trusted certificate, it's good, then maybe they trust GoDaddy, but you can buy your own GoDaddy certificate and just use it, and even though the domain name's different, it might say it's okay. So that could be a problem. Newer versions of OpenSSL support hosting verification. They could also do the other way around. Maybe they don't check the trust chain, but they check the host name. Well, meetup proxy is good enough for that case. Another, you might say this is a dumb mistake, 
So in that list of three features that TLS provides, confidentiality, integrity, and server authentication, there are actually ways in TLS to maybe release or get rid of one of those features. And one of them is server authentication. There are special cipher suites in TLS called anonymous cipher suites where that whole like send the certificate and verify stuff just goes away. Sounds like a dumb mistake. Again, in OpenSSL, it's easy to get confused. And the function for configuring which cipher suites you trust, where you would typically say like AES128 CBC or uh, triple des with CBC or something else like that, it gives you these shorthand names that sound good, like high, high strength, right? Unfortunately, that only applies to the symmetric cryptography. High includes anonymous. Not a good thing. And if they did that mistake, there are ways to actually run OpenSSL itself in anonymous mode. Similarly, there are null symmetric encryption, where you authenticate the server, but you don't encrypt anything. Well, TCP dump or Wireshark would be appropriate here. You don't even need to go through all these other steps. And finally, one of the things that, if you've paid attention over the past couple of years, just about every implementation of TLS has had some form or another of critical security vulnerability, whether it's Apple's go-to-fail, go-to-fail thing, so you skip over the certificate check. The change cipher spec injection, which I think affected like everything except NSS. Drown, logjam, and so on, Poodle. Just about every implementation has had some kind of problem. If you're looking at an IoT device and they're not diligent about firmware updates, maybe they're using OpenSSL 098C or something, and you might be able to just go to the change log and see problems. So wrapping up for questions here, the main technique for bypassing TLS that I would use is to modify the list of trusted CAs. I've shown you four platforms. The same principles apply to anything. So maybe you're looking at some embedded device that runs embedded Linux and BusyBox and so forth. It probably has a list of trusted CAs somewhere on there that you can edit if you can break into the device. Maybe there's a UART or who knows what else. Failing that, certificate pinning is usually the most common obstacle that would cause modifying that trusted list to not work. Patching, debugging are the ways to go there. Maybe you forget all this, maybe you have the source code to the application because you're in a security assessment. I mean, that could be another way. And finally, if there are implementation mistakes or misconfigurations, you could go that route. So given that, do we have some questions? Yes. Um, can you use Vitler to do the same thing? Or, uh, Did you say Vitler? Vitler. Yeah. I'm not familiar with that, I don't think. That's uh, okay. to do scan the network traffic and so on, but for HTTPS and that shouldn't be. Well, that, well, if it provides man in the middle functionality, then possibly yeah. it's just that. You got their own proxy and all. Yeah. Possibly. Fiddler is what it be a proxy. Well, you said Fiddler. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess I don't know about that tool. Uh, <laughs> yes? What are anonymous cipher suites in OpenSSL? Right, so anonymous cipher suites, once again, there's no certificate exchanged. So there's like client hello, server hello, let's do anonymous. It's good day, right? And the actual interesting thing in, in OpenSSL, if you write a callback for bad certificate or for certificate verify, if it's an anonymous cipher suite, it just doesn't call it. So you can say verify peer, and the peer is verified according to the definition of an anonymous cipher suite. Anything else? Okay, um, so contact information. I think I might have some cards or whatever. If not, you can, where, I guess it's on the east side of the yard website.